Welcome to the Hybrid Files. I'm your curious space traveler hybrid helper. I'll be embarking on thought-provoking concepts and critical discussions about culture and society with a sprinkle of personal reflection. Have you found yourself surfing the online Milky Way, otherwise known as the Internet, lured to certain online constellations that harbor captivating topics and Jupiter-like content with the gravitational pull to keep you glued to your screen? You find yourself soaking up the low oxygen <coughs> like a helpless sponge? only later realizing you are pondering the essence of what you have absorbed and lost a block of time. That's exactly where I find myself, musing over the intricacies of subjects as I navigate planetary-like articles, black hole-like videos, and hard-hitting asteroid thought pieces. I hope to attract the avid alien thinker the curious Martian soul, or simply a Venusian who loves a good podcast. I do believe there's something here for everyone. Now, over the past few weeks, I've been head and neck deep into a spacewalk of a truly thought-provoking book titled Rethinking Commodification, Cases and Readings in Law and Culture. Edited by... Ertman and Joan C. Williams. I was inspired to find resources about what my mind was slowly concluding, that America is a store. This book was, or this book has ignited a rocket-sized spark within me to dive headfirst into the multifaceted multiverse of commodification. But before we dive in too deep, let me give you a glimpse of where my spaceship of thought and pondering will take you this season. Please accompany me to the rarefied atmosphere called commodification. What it is, how it affects the American psyche, through thought, consent, consumption, and culture. Let's explore the effects on relationships, community, family, the human body, birthing in babies, our environment, natural and man-made, social infrastructure, social currency, and the ultimate culmination into the commodified American. At the end of the season, I'll give you my opinion on the commodified American where I think we're headed. I believe there is an unacknowledged psychological movement within American mind. It is completely and wholly influenced by the buying and selling of everything. Rethinking commodification confirms it refers to the process where everyday objects and experiences are turned into a product that can be bought and sold and seductively packaged. It's a phenomenon that perme permeates modern society. I'm of the opinion that everything in America is up for commodification, for reasons to go to war, to reasons to hate another country and other people, uh, to how you approach other people and how you accept or do not accept yourself. I believe America's true name should be the United Store of America, because everything is up for sale. This is why I say we are sold, and we are sold. What that means is we are the buyer and the seller. We are the persuader and the convinced. Let me show you where I see commodification. I really do see it everywhere in our little American galaxy. China appears to be constructing the ultimate tool of social control. 
a comprehensive credit score system that will make your head spin. That's what the American Civil Liberties Union ACLU, wrote on October 5th, 2015. This newly emerging, soon to be all-encompassing surveillance network, it said, would give everyone in China a score between 350 and 950. But unlike, say, American credit scores, these would punish everything from jaywalking to government criticism. Even more disturbingly, you could be responsible for the actions of your friends and family. The rest of the article mainly focused on the United States. The ACLU, after all, is an American nonprofit. It lobbies for things like free speech, privacy, and criminal justice reform. This was not new reporting. The author was open about his sources, other articles he had read online. Neither did he claim to have any expertise on China. In fact, just three days later, he updated the article, softening the tone and emphasizing that he only meant to caution against potential abuses in America. But it didn't matter. What mattered was that a high-profile, well-respected institution had stamped its seal of approval, and other organizations took notice. Two days after the original ACLU article went live and a day before it issued the update, Computer World republished it, calling the Chinese system Orwellian. Popular Science wrote that although, quote, the system isn't explicitly dystopian yet, it has all the pieces to be dystopian at a moment's notice. And Reason claimed these scores would soon define Chinese citizens' lives. In less than a week, the social credit system had not only entered the English media landscape, but also, seemingly, amassed a body of evidence. Multiple sources endorsing the same alarming conclusion. Never mind that they all reference the same ACLU report written by a non-expert, largely about the United States, itself based on earlier speculation. News travels fast, and headlines even faster. There was no need for some grand conspiracy to smear China, or bad faith on the part of any individual author. The simple market pressures of 21st century journalism were enough to make a story appear out of thin air. America's often quite justified suspicion of the Chinese government and technology in general were just icing on the cake. Since then, the social credit system has truly taken on a life of its own, with coverage by the Financial Times, Economist, Fortune, and countless others. This now eight-year-old game of telephone culminated in an appearance at the White House, with Vice President Mike Pence describing it as an Orwellian system premised on controlling virtually every facet of human life. And yet, ask a friend, colleague, or classmate who spent time in China about their experience, and you'll likely be met with confusion. This is not a case of censorship. The Chinese government does engage in extensive censorship, but for the social credit system to work as described, the public must be, at a minimum, aware of its existence. Neither is this the result of propaganda. The government does engage in propaganda. But in this case, the response is not anger, frustration, or disagreement, just confusion. Because for all of its well-documented, genuine atrocities, the Orwellian credit score system imagined by many in the media simply doesn't exist. So, as this creator pointed out, Polly Matters uh, shows that our American uh, media machine rushed in like a proto star eager to sell to the american public a greasy shuttle window on the chinese social credit system even though the author later updated their article softening the tone only to emphasize potential abuses if america looked towards adopting such a system the american outlets had not thoroughly flushed out the nuances of what they were reporting on. They hit print because what a news product must be is delivered fast. 
giving us, the American people, our daily bread of half-baked constellation ideas about what another country is doing so that we can be immediately sold on the idea of the dangers of that country. Get us all nice and frothy for the vote, right? Now, I'm no political space animal, but even our well-intentioned journalists are influenced by the American need to sell and self-ask. The act of reporting accurately about what something is has been slowly and quickly sacrificed for profit margin. Whereas in the past, an American could trust their reporter to dive deep into a subject to collect any nuances that may exist and clarify a description of a thing or phenomenon. It is now a space race to be the first to report. You know, I don't know about you, but I want the factual description of a thing, concept or idea. I want to know, I want to think for myself. I don't want to be sold prematurely about something. One way or another, I want to come to my own conclusions. If I am to fly into the Death Star. <laughs> Commodification of things like friendship, love, or personal achievements can lead to a sense of detachment. We might start evaluating personal relationships in economic terms, for instance, which can be very dehumanizing. The social credit score has already been implemented in China for decades now, but now your trustworthiness and character is up for comparison and sale. Wherever there is an artificial value system, there is a currency that can be made from it i.e. a commodity. Here are some examples of that. Joe Aini is retired. But when her town was brought into a new government program, her services were required. Now, she gets paid about 50 bucks a month to watch and record the lives of her 3,000 neighbors as one of six so-called information collectors. China started piloting its social score system in 2015 in villages like this one. Here's how it works. You start with a thousand points. If you do something bad, you get points docked. If you do something good and you happen to be spotted, you get a boost. These journals filled with tales of neighbors helping old people are seen leaving trash in hallways end up in a local office. A government employee gives each entry a score. The results go public. On top of that, he got this didn't pocket the money he found trophy. Raising his score could mean more money later, with lower interest loans and discounts on utilities and rent. Wang Fengbo thinks the system isn't just about the points. It works because people want to save face. Uh, 
，哎呀，就就就是就哎呀，俺多少个大家长了，然后就就写上英文，都要爱面子。你给他写就行，你写好，写你好，哎，你写肯定是写了，是脸上妖艳很光彩。你写的不好，他写了，他脸上也不光彩，人还有知名呀。But the program is more than just public naming and shaming. If someone slips below a thousand points, even just a little, there are serious consequences. B 级呃九百五十分 B 级，意味着你呃 B 级意味着你将来坐飞机呀、高消费呀，或者是什么呃贷款呐都不能做了，都不能都不可以。Zhang Yingjie co-signed a loan for a friend who later skipped out. He paid his share, but the local court didn't care. 我前两天去淄博，赶上暑假没有票了，我我就得买这个头等舱。结果是说你信用度不够，不能买头等舱。我回来没办法，不能还是没有座位，回来坐这个大巴。高铁不是三个四三个小时，四个小时就到了，大巴车得十个多小时。Four million people have been blocked from buying high-speed train tickets over low social credit, and more than eleven million from buying flights. To raise his score, Zhang gets in line at a local community office to donate money the government says will go to charity. Zhang keeps track of his social score closely, but he doesn't keep track of where his donations end up. 你这个具体给需要把它接，你问，具体得问他，我也不知道这个事。Now these citizens who are subjected to this system are sold to their own detriment. You saw the man; he's really trying to get in good so that he can fly as opposed to get on a bus.、Um, there's certain aspects of this already in our country. We have HOAs. We have a phenomenon called Karen Ning. Right, people are sold on their entitlement. People are sold on the 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 package of I buy this home in this area in this gated community. I'm willing to pay, and so I should get this product. But you're actually the product, and the HOA. Well, some say that's just a very organized group of Karens. <laughs> They've been sold on the whole idea that even though someone else may own a piece of property, own,、uh, that they also have rights to tell that person how to live in that space, how it should look, what you should do in it, outside of it, to the side of it, in the general area of it. That's also a package, but that's neither here nor there, and we can get into the details of that in another episode. But let's continue. Now, remember when I said earlier that commodification can affect your psyche? Let's look at a scene from a Netflix series called The Upshaws. I'll be back with my commentary. Now this scene jumped out at me. It, in my opinion, it demonstrated how commodification can seep into your subconscious, i.e., your psyche, and create these harmful expectations you might have of yourself and others. Commodification creates these harmful thoughts and self-talk about. How we should behave and move in very stressful and challenging moments in our lives, and even though we don't think it's harmful in the moment, it ends up harming us in the end. This episode, as you saw, was about Regina having a breakthrough after including Benny in her therapy sessions. She wanted to share that she figured out what her exact issue was, and began recounting how her expectations of being the best made her perform, provide, and protect everyone 
but herself. Regina mentions that even her parents said she was the best of them. Doesn't that sound like a package that was sold not only to her, but to her family? It's like the behavior begat the notion that begat the behavior. Interesting how that works, right? Everything for Regina just snowballed into an unacknowledged burden because that is not what the best daughter, the best mom, the best girlfriend, the best wife, the best sister does. They do not break. They push forward. They go on. They endure. Regina is the best. That is the commodity. The idea of being the best, good, better best, are words of what now? Comparison. Hmm. Comparison. There is a noticeable effect on your mental health when you begin to compare. It can innocently begin at an early age, but over time creates self-esteem issues, anxiety, depression. According to psychology today, it's a, it's a trap. Human beings should not be compared. We are not things. We are complex. We are sentient beings, and our psyche is complicated. If you fed your psyche a false narrative, it would be convinced by that falsehood. All that false narrative is marketing, merchandising, and PR. And in Regina's case about being the best, which is extrinsic instead of mastery over self, which is intrinsic, we as American citizens have been persuaded that it's okay to put aside those real aha moments for the sole purpose of making yourself marketable to someone else and for someone else's consumption and benefit. That is all. That is the commodified American. Well, that's it for this episode. I'll see you in the next one. Maybe we'll talk about relationships. I don't know. I'm still trying to decide. Happy, happy galaxy.